totally comfortable and did a little bit of explanation and saved me a little time because the sooner we're done, the sooner they can share their gifts. <laughs> so we saw earlier this nice Ansel Adams photograph of the 85 foot that uh, Carl and Tom both used frequently. Here's a picture of Carl and Tom at the focus of the 85 foot, breaking a few safety rules. <laughs> uh, that's Tom, you'll notice, precariously balancing off the edge of that crane. Uh, these guys were also noted delinquents and vandals. You'll see that they, uh, they spray painted this 85 foot. I'm not sure if anyone ever gave them any trouble for that. I can't get away with that these days, no way. Um, there they are, uh, up at the up at the focus. There, there's Carl at the focus, and uh, there's Carl and Tom in between the focus of the dish, uh, up on the crane there. Uh, so, now <clears throat> this is the Hat Creek Dormitory. So I've heard stories. Maybe Carl can confirm these. It's probably pre-trolling times, mm -hmm. but. There was uh, two copies, two volumes, if you remember, of Messiah's Quantum Mechanics. Alcohol was not allowed in the dormitory at Hat Creek. Strictly forbidden. <laughs> so, there was always <laughs> a bottle of Jack Daniels behind quantum mechanics book. The argument was, if you needed quantum mechanics in the middle of Bernie or Hat Creek, California, you needed some Jack Daniels. So, uh, apparently this lasted a while, but they moved the library. Is that correct? Uh, so the dorm had no more library, no more hidden place for the Jack Daniels, as far as I knew. Then when I was sent to Hat Creek to observe at BIMA, uh, the Susie Jorgensen was uh, running the place. She you had to warm up to Susie a bit. But when I finally told Susie that uh, I worked with Carl and Tom, she lit up and she said, follow me. <laughs> she brought me to a closet and opened the door and said, I've been saving this for their return for the last 15 years. <laughs> It's the original bottle of Jack Daniels still waiting for you behind the hot water heater in the dormitory. So, when I got to, to Berkeley, I went off to the Green Bank Telescope to do some Zeeman scanning. So, here's a great slide from Ron Bracewell. Uh, you know, he says, the, you, know, you can learn astronomy by, uh, with the, from books without ever looking through a telescope. That is not the Berkeley way. One has to go out and do some observing. It should be historically noted that the year after he said this, he moved to Stanford. <laughs> no good. So uh, we went down to, to uh, Green Bank. My first big observing run was with uh, all of the Zavon cohorts you've seen and will see tomorrow. Um, but up until this point, there's an important point in my life <clears throat> where my life changed. I was a teetotaler. I did not drink. Carl said, without asking any religious, moral, medical, philosophical questions, he just said, this is not acceptable. <laughs> so, <laughs> I got the little glass, Tom and Carl got the big glasses, and uh, I began my education. <laughs> But what was strange to me, if you look at the bottle up there, I had heard all these stories about Jack Daniels. We heard some from Tom this evening. But what was strange to me is after we ran out of whiskey, Tom ordered from one of the 17 states that ships liquor between one another, a big box of Puerto Rican rum called Baronito. You can see there's the little baby eating a, a barrel, a little, bar <laughs> little barrel, a barrel, 86 proof. And this was, uh, this is what we drank every night for many weeks. Uh, this is what it was like afterwards. <laughs> and uh, there's a, <laughs> so uh, eventually we discovered, as you heard earlier, that the GBT wasn't going to work out as a Zaman machine because of a poor design for the L-band feed. 
So I got lucky, very lucky. Later on, was able to use the Air Hugo <coughs> telescope to make detections of Zeeman splitting in the other galaxies using mega masers. So I was able to finally graduate. But one of the interesting things is Carl's grad students, and you've heard a lot of that in this meeting so far, a lot of Carl's grad students were smart enough to come to Carl, get him excited about a topic that they were really interested in, even if it wasn't Carl's expertise. And he funded them, and he gave them expertise. I see a lot of nodding heads, and that was very supportive. Tom and I were dumb enough to do something that Carl really, really knew a lot about. <laughs> and we each spent the better part of a decade at Berkeley. There's a unit in the Berkeley Astronomy Department called the Trollins, and it's a 10-year span. <laughs> I got out in point eight Trollins. <laughs> and an important thing is that before we got to meet Carl, you can see on the left there's little Tommy Trolland. There's Timmy Robichaud on the right. These guys, this is before they met Carl, and uh, they were conformists. <laughs> you see, they were conformists. But then we got to working with Carl, and you'll see there's a noticeable change. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I'd say that one of the first things that happened was we became non-conformists. <laughs> But we heard earlier, there's another possibility. You could be a conformist, you could be a non-conformist, or you could align. So, <laughs> over time, after a decade of working with Carl, there was an alignment. <laughs> so, back on track. So, Last week, I went down to, <laughs> actually a year ago, I went down to Puerto Rico. I also went down last week. Um, <laughs> I got in very late in the San Juan, and I did not want to do the two hour drive to Arecibo. So, I was driving along, and I saw a street sign, and it said Bayamon, and that was the first place that looked like, it passed the jail. I thought, okay, we're past the jail. I'll find a place here, I pulled off. I bed down for the night. In the morning, I wake up and I, it just occurred to me. I thought, geez, Bible, why do I know that name? And in the clear light of the morning, I realized, I remembered it from those hundreds and hundreds of bottles of Baralita, they say by the mom. So I went to the front desk and I asked the woman at the front desk, do you know about this rum called Baralita? And she looked at me and she said, no. The janitor was sweeping the floor behind the desk. And he said, I know. And I said, how do I get to this magical Baralito location? And he proceeded to draw a map. The important thing is he said, it's right next to the jail. Don't go into the jail. So I drove around and I saw a long line of people at the jail, just true out in front. But right next to it, there was an old sign. The Ron del Barrelito. So it also said, don't trespass. And there was a jail next door, so that's a reasonable thing to put there. But I went in anyway, and I found the old grounds. Uh, they've been making this run since the mid-1800s. And I saw the Hacienda de Santa Ana. And I just walked in, because I thought, well, why not? I'm here. And I found the proprietor, whose name is on the bottle, Edmundo, Mundo Fernandez. His family's been making this for over 100 years. And he was so excited to hear that this was the drink of choice at Arecibo. He gave me a three-hour tour. <laughs> three hour tour. It was incredible. He showed me the original tanks where they make Farabita. He showed me the entire stock. <laughs> He showed me the production line. Those are only two stars. No good. Three stars, Trace Estrellas, as muy importante. <laughs> but what really struck me is that we were walking through, and there was this little tiny room. And in that little tiny room were little tiny barrels. <laughs> There's my foot for comparison. <laughs> and I said, what are these? And he said, yeah, Baronitos. <laughs> I said, 
uh, can you tell me more? So he said, these barrels, which is, I've been pointed out, or it's been pointed out to me, not legal in America, but these barrels are brought in by families who have had these barrelitos in their families for 100 years or so, and they bring them in, and they're filled up, and then at their convenience, they come back and take them back home. So that got me thinking. I remembered, well, there's that little barrelito that the baby's holding on the bottom, right? And then, a couple hours later into the tour, we passed another room, and I saw a wood shop. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, this is where our Cooper makes little barrels. I had an idea. So I contacted all of Carl's grad students, if you want to come up here. And so we decided that for a present for his all of the help he gives us, and to express how much we're thankful for all of Carl's help, we got the Cooper at Barrelito to make Carl his very own little bear. <laughs> on how to make sure it retains all this value. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and it's signed by, by all the students. All kinds of people here. Right? That's right, here, we'll put it on the little. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 